the Divine Comedy itself has a sort of inconclusive quality about it. Uh, Dante reaches uh, and, and, and experiences the beatific vision, and yet his text um, succumbs to the enormity of uh, the task of describing it. And there were a number of reasons why we said Dante does that. I mean, what seems to be and is a defeat at the level of the imagination turns out to be uh, a great triumph for Dante's own theology, right? Because it's in the measure in which that the poem ends in a kind of defeat, in a sort of the, with the admission of the impossibility for Dante, the poet's language, to contain and therefore reify, circumscribe that which he has seen, right? Uh, he's sort of uh, ending with this, uh, um, this, this question mark, this, this uh, vision of our effigy, as he says, our own image, in, uh, that's all that is left in, uh, for him to recall, which really means that uh, in the refusal to pinpoint, to describe, and define the so-called beatific vision. Some people can be very disappointed. Why doesn't he tell us what he really saw? Because that would be the statement valid for him. He wants us, at the end of the poem, to adventure, to take, to take our own journey and, and make our own discoveries about that which remains the essential point of the Divine Comedy, as is the essential point of all great texts of our tradition. The encounter between the human and the divine. That is the point of all the great epics, whether it is in the form of uh, the Aeneid, where the hero is always uncertain about what the oral, the, the gods are telling him, uncertain as how to def decipher it, and yet he nonetheless pursues uh, what he takes to be, and, mis and makes mistakes, Aeneas, along the way, uh, about what he takes to be God's will. This is the, the way he can live out his own sense of ethical imperative to himself, to his people, the refugees that are coming from Asia Minor and going to, to an unknown land, and the divine imperatives. Or whether it's going to be Renaissance texts from, from uh, uh, Spencer's Fairy Queen to Tassos to Milton, all is, to Lucretius, who writes in a theological epic. The idea he wants to to, to cure his readers, his, he has one reader in mind, a young Epicurean, and this is Lucretius, whom Dante had never read. He, he read in parts and was very fascinated by what he read. Who wants to educate one young man, Memmius, a young Epicurean, to the real and bitter truth of what the, the, uh, the Epicurean philosophy may be. And that bitter truth, the harsh truth, Lucretius thinks is that there is no such a thing, that the, the, that ours are, that the Roman world is a desecrated world, that the gods have fled. That's the, but that is a still, in the mode of an atheism, atheism, it is still a theological concern, because uh, the implication of what I'm saying is that atheism itself may be a, a way of addressing, of course it's a way of addressing the question of God, uh, the unknowability of God, the distance of God, maybe the non-existence of the gods. The divine comedy from this point of view partakes of this extraordinary tradition. But he does it in a way which is remarkably different. Dante does his theology in a way which is remarkably different from anything else that's gone on before him and in many ways after him.